Blitch, uh, Dharma in America, Short History of the Hindu Jain Diaspora. And uh, um, um, it has the photo of, I think, a Tirthankar in a Jain temple, probably in the US. So that's the cover. So just, just a very quick check. Uh, how many people have actually had a chance to look at this book, uh, if anybody has, apart from the people speaking on it? I have not read it. I've only seen the reviews of it. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Very good, very good. Uh, no worries, because uh, actually uh, you have an advantage over me. I have not read a single of the reviews. I've just read the book. But... Uh, Anyhow, if, if we can uh, begin, then I just want to say once again, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us in our continuing book discussion series. And uh, we were interested in this book partly because we just came out of a conference uh, on Indology. We have a series called Rethinking Indology. And we just had a conference, a virtual conference called Beyond the Imperialism of Categories. And uh, of course, the phrase comes from Lloyd and Susan uh, Rudolph, who taught, uh, who was social anthropologist, they taught at the University of Chicago. And uh, the entire, uh, I mean, I thought the conference went really well. It started with the, uh, with the keynote uh, by Professor Bob Thurman, uh, who, who, who retired from Columbia, but he's leading a, an important translation project on uh, what he calls Sanskrit Buddhism. But it's basically about a very, very large corpus of uh, Tibetan texts, uh, which originally uh, came from Sanskrit. And uh, now we are restoring them back, as it were, if not to Sanskrit, certainly to English, which is uh, a very interesting project in itself. But I brought it up because Amit, Amit is working on translation. And a lot of the work of culture, especially cross-cultural uh, explorations, analysis, is in a profound sense uh, a work of translation. We don't have to look at it as a translation of a particular text uh, only or a particular, uh, as you said, uh, amid some news bulletin, then you translate it, you have a poem, you translate it. No, I think the harder work is of translating categories, of translating cultures, and in fact, of translating civilizations, uh, because we know so little about one another, frankly, if you go into it in detail. Uh, and uh, even, in a sense, the world with the largest, uh, the, the country with the largest cultural footprint in the world, uh, the United States, we really know very little about the United States in terms of all the different currents and cross currents which went into uh, its making and into what it has become today. And in, in the multiple uh, such cross currents, which uh, you know created this melting pot, if not Sangha, certainly uh, you know, the Indian diaspora has played an important role and more and more we are beginning to come to terms with it. Uh, and uh, the new trend, as I see it, uh, is to identify this diaspora, uh, you know, differentiate it, not just call it the Indian diaspora. But this this is a trend we see in other uh, kinds of inquiries as well. For example, if you have an upsurge of, uh, uh, say, women's studies, and then, then you have uh, more specialized studies, you see, uh, Chicano women's studies, you know, colored women's studies, African-American, Asian Americans. So, I mean, you start by identifying a particular group and then the subgroups get identified. And uh, this is what is happening in this book, where from Indian diaspora, you're shifting to a Hindu Jain diaspora. Now, why Hindu Jain? Why that hyphenation? This is a very important issue. We'll come back to it later. Because I think Pankaji says uh, early on in the book that... Uh, till I think the 1880s or so, Jains were not identified separately even in the census in India, let alone in the United States. And this sort of identity uh, assertion is very recent in the United States. Uh, when I visited a few years ago, uh, uh, I actually 
went to several Jain temples, you see, in the US, especially in the Chicago area. And uh, uh, I've, I've done a little bit of uh, reading on courses in Jain studies, chairs in Jain studies being set up in the US. Uh, and last time Chris Chappell came to this Indology conference, he talked a little bit about uh, this upsurge in Jain studies. So this is happening uh, in a concerted way. But uh, what Pankaji does, the hyphenation is of great interest. So we'll come back to that later. But uh, the, the, uh, the back cover says that approximately 5 million Hindus and Jains uh, live in the U.S. Uh, today. Not all are citizens. So the numbers are more than the voting uh, population. But we saw uh, with, uh, uh, with the nomination of uh, uh, Kamala Harris for vice president that this has become a very important moment in in uh, Indo-US relations. You've got, for the first time, a vice president of Indian origin. And uh, in addition to that, uh, there is definitely uh, an Indian uh, turn uh, in uh, you know the amount of influence that Indians wield in the US. Uh, Indians are probably the wealthiest minority, uh, maybe after the Jews, the most influential minority, in the US today. And you see this as a global trend. Look at Britain. Uh, look at the number of cabinet members who are from India, uh, not just Rishi Shona, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, but Preeti Patel and others as well in the Boris Johnson cabinet. And you go all the way to Australia, Amit will tell us more about it, uh, and New Zealand. There are very important Indian uh, and visible members uh, in in the government, and of course Fiji is maybe 40, 42 percent Indian, and that's a different story altogether. So what we're trying to say is this has become a very important moment for the global Indian diaspora, not only in terms of its uh, weight in their own host countries, but also in the amount of influence they wield in the home country, which is obviously India. Now, in our current second wave, we've gone through this huge crisis. And I was reading in today's Economic Times that the Indian diaspora in the US has raised half a billion dollars at this crucial moment, and also the medicines and other interventions. So uh, what I'm trying to say is the topic has great importance, not only in terms of the, uh, you know, our continuing interest in Indology, Indic studies, or Indian diaspora, but really this Indian movement worldwide. Uh, now, having said this, what is special about this book? You know, as Amit knows, we've been interested in this field of diaspora studies for a while. Way back in the 90s, I did a book, an edited book called In Diaspora, you know, texts and theories. And that was a good book because some of the chapters in the book later became independent books like... Uh, I think Professor Vijay Mishra, who's a leading theorist of the Indian diaspora, has written extensively on it uh, and has recently did, uh, done two books on Salman Rushdie. He's doing a book on V.S. Napal. So he's a very important scholar and uh, he's theorized what uh, the literature of the Indian diaspora is about. So a chapter uh, of uh, our book on India diaspora in the 90s then became a part uh, of his, you know, standalone book. So we've been interested in this for a while, as Amit also knows. But what's different about this book? What's different about uh, Pankaj Jain's book? The way I look at it is, especially for us who approach diaspora studies from the literary point of view, you know, we, we are, in a sense, overburdened with theory. You know, we try to theorize the literature of the diaspora and how is it... Uh, 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 you know, what are its distinctive characteristics? And I remember something from uh, from Vijay Mishra's book, which I think is very important. So uh, he he has theorized, uh, he, he says, what's the difference between a diaspora, for example, uh, and uh, what we call, uh, you know, the upward, uh, you know, the, the worldwide upwardly mobile, uh, you know, uh, transnational categories. So 
you have the idea of the diaspora, then you have the idea of the the these these transnationals. So he's basically he says that uh, there's a big difference. You know, he, he theorizes it, and we can start there and then come to why this book is different. He theorizes it in terms of the old diaspora and the new diaspora. The old diaspora is the diaspora of labor, and the new diaspora is the diaspora of capital. And here, capital doesn't just mean money. It means it means cultural capital, like you're doing Manipuri dance, Kathakali, yoga, Ayurveda. That's all a part of this book, okay? Ayurveda and yoga are very important in this book. Uh, but also intellectual capital, you know, the techies uh, uh, in, in the Silicon Valley. They're very important today in the United States. Uh, the top CEOs are, are of Indian origin, not just, you know, Sundar Pichai and, uh, mm, uh, you know, and uh, 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 who's, the, who's the Google, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's Sundar and there's the other guy. What's his name? Nadella. Satya Nadella. Exactly. Thank you. It was slipping my mind. But there's a whole host of these guys. So these, according to uh, Vijay Mishra, are people who've left voluntarily. And it's like they've got the best of both worlds. They've got the best of their home country and the host country. And they're not limited. They're not limited to the countries of their current residence, the whole world is their oyster, as it were. So he distinguishes these two kinds of diasporas, and he he uses, in a way, the Ram Charit Manas is a, like a toolkit, the, the Hindu toolkit, you know. So the basic point is, is going back to Freud. He's saying that the old diaspora suffered a wrench from the homeland because they were indentured laborers, by and large. And they were pushed out of the homeland. They were recruited by these middlemen. And they became girmitias, the people who signed an agreement. And to that extent, uh, theirs is a never healing wound. So even if they move you know, from Suriname to Canada or from Fiji to Australia or New Zealand. So see, the diaspora is always fluid. That's the first point. And it never returns to the homeland. So that's the second point. But the inflection, the inflection point in this discussion is in the new diaspora, you're digitally connected with the homeland and you can intervene there and you can move back and forth. You know, I mean, look at the, uh, the, last, uh, the last CEO of Infosys. I think Mr. Sikka, if, his, if, if my memory serves me like, right, Vishal Sikka. And I, and I remember how Mr. Narayana Murthy introduced him. He says, you know, Vishal Sikka means big money. You know, Sikka means money. So he, we want him to make big bucks for us. And Mr. Sikka has returned to California, wherever he is now. So the mobility of the diaspora and uh, its access to the homeland digitally, the idea of the OCI, Overseas Citizen of India, uh, has changed this notion of the diaspora as a never healing wound. Uh, now, having said that, now let's let's transit to this. So, what I like about this book is it's it's not theoretical. It's not over theoretical. It's actually an assemblage of facts. It's a melange because later he's got interviews also, and he. I think what's good about this book is 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 Pankaji is. Uh, as it were, turning the the searchlight on certain uh, sort of ignored aspects of the diaspora, things we have not gone into uh, in great detail. Uh, the cultural aspects, that's one. Uh, like I already mentioned, yoga and Ayurveda. The Jain aspects, the identity assertion, uh, and yet the hyphenation. I'll come back to that, as I said. I'll dial back to that when I conclude my opening remarks. So the join aspects, that's the second one. Uh, the academic aspect, how it's studied in the religious studies departments. And then what I found very fascinating is the early connections. The early parts of the book I found really interesting. And I want to point our attention to two of his major sources. MV Kamath has a book, which is really important. I started looking at that book because of, of uh, what Pankaji 
had done. And uh, in addition, I want to recommend this very interesting book called Heathen Hindu Hindu. Hindu, the second Hindu is Hindu, actually, H I N D O O. American Representations of India, 1721, 1893. Now, this is this early work. This is by Michael J. Altman. So, M. V. Kamath's book, which was published by ICCR, I haven't got a hold of that book yet, but I'd like to. And this book, Heathen, Hindu, 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 uh, published by Oxford uh, in 2017. I think these are important books which, which are pointing us to aspects of this whole uh, diaspora issue, which we haven't looked at earlier. Similarly, Nico Slate's book, very important book, Colored Cosmopolitanism, where he looks at America's contribution to India's freedom struggle, the Gandhi connection, that's been studied already. But Homi Bhabha also talked about it, the race issues, you know. See how, how Indians intervened in America's civil rights and race uh, issues. Now, Black Lives Matter has become a big deal. But Indian uh, uh, leaders, including Sarojini Naidu, have done a bit of work on her. She met uh, 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 Du Bois, and they, they, they align themselves with the struggle for justice of colored people in the US. And that's very important in the history of democratic politics. I mentioned Kamala Harris, whose father was Jamaican. So there's a deep history uh, that's going on there. So the point I'm trying to make is the book alerts us to these early connections and also to, it's not just about the Indian diaspora in the US. It's about Indo-US relations. That's also a very, very important book. Uh, and in, if you want to understand Indo-US relations, you have to understand these two contrary trends in America's understanding of India, which Pankaji talks about at the beginning of the book. In the early days of the Puritans, where Cotton Mather, uh, sitting in Boston, was fulminating about hell and brimstone, you know, trying to rally, uh, uh, you know, uh, the settlers uh, from a new materialistic civilization to which they were attracted to their old Puritan values, saying you're going to go to hell, dudes, if you're not going to go back to the Bible. So uh, how did people like Cotton Mather, uh, as it were, the wasp aristocracy, view India? And they obviously saw it as a land of heathens, which were uh, waiting to be redeemed by the light of Christ and Christianity. So that's one trajectory which still persists today. Uh, till today, it persists when you uh, see in the uh, in the Caucasus and in the uh, Hill uh, committee meetings on religious freedom, how. Uh, the evangelical groups are targeting India uh, and uh, measuring religious freedom in India and funding proselytization, evangelism in India. So that that line still continues. And a defining moment for that is 1893, the World's Parliament of Religions, and, uh, and how Vivekananda was actually attacked by some of these groups, you know, who brought up Sati and all these matters. And, and Indians were behind it partly. Indians, uh, uh, you know, like Rama Bai, uh, 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 her group, you know, was also a part. Pandita Rama Bai, who was a Brahmin lady from uh, Pune, who was a great Sanskrit scholar, amazing lady. She had an intercaste marriage. Her husband died. She became a widow. And then, you know, she made a big statement by becoming Christian because widows were being badly treated by Hindus at that time. So the Ramabai group attacked Vivekananda. So all this politics uh, continues in one fashion today. And so the two images of India, going back to the beginning, the land of heathens, and then the so-called Boston Brahmins, Ralph Waldo Emerson, all the way to uh, Walt Whitman. Uh, Pankaji talks about it. A better book for that is Phil Goldberg's American Veda. So this tremendous interest in India 
in translations from India, uh, a great respect for India, for the Bhagavad Gita, for the Upanishads. Uh, in a way, Ram Mohan Roy starts it long back, but the Theosophists step in. Alcott is an American, Blavatsky is a Russian. And that interest continues till this day with yoga and now more recently Ayurveda, the positive images of India, all the gurus who went there. So these two contrary images of India persist. And you can see that in the politics. On the one hand, you have, uh, of course, Kamala Harris, who's Christian, and you have Tulsi Gabbard, who is uh, a Hindu, and she's been targeted. You see the politics of how she has been targeted uh, by groups, by evangelical groups. And she's spoken out against Hindu phobia in the US. You know, and how if you enter politics, uh, you know, like Bobby Jindal and others, you first have to become Christian, you know, to be acceptable. Uh, so Kamala Harris uh, projects herself as black and as Christian. And the Indian part of her heritage is a little more uh, sort of muted, submerged. It's not that we are accusing her of anything. I'm just saying that you see the way it plays out. That's all I'm just. So this is a part of this book. Now, I'm just going to conclude my overlong remarks because I was hoping that Pankaji would join, but I'm sure there's something uh, really, uh, you know, uh, I just hope there's nothing, uh, you know, that we need to worry about because he's a very professional person. I've known him for 20 years. So if he's just disappeared, there must be some reason which we are not aware of. Otherwise, he would have told us that he's not able to make it. Uh, so I hope everything is good with him. So I'm going to conclude now and invite our two speakers, uh, first uh, Amit Ji and then Nandini Ji. But I, I wanted to simply say that uh, one of the fascinating things about this book is it's also a very uh, moving personal account. It starts in a small town in Rajasthan called Pali, where uh, he grows up. And this explains the hyphenation, that the communities were so together there were intermarriages. They went to each other's temples and attended the festivities. And he, he always liked to go to the Hindu temples because prasad bahut acha milta tha wahan pe. So he talks about that. So growing up in that background and then going to the U.S. and doing this work and then working to preserve this uh, hyphenation because there's also a push in the U.S. that the Jains want to you know, have their own narrative now. Because being associated with Hindus is not really interesting or popular for many. It's much more cool to be a Buddhist, you see. Uh, it's, it's, it's cool to have other identities for whatever reason. So, of course, there's a politics to this, which, uh, which Pankaji is also talking about in a bit, uh, uh, you know, here. But he wants to retain that uh, Hindu Jain, uh, uh, you might say, hyphenation and partnership all the way uh, to the diaspora, whereas there is a much bigger temptation for all these groups to, on the one hand, secede from India and then, you know, to secede from a bigger Indian identity. And you see it. You see it at the ethnic association level. There will always be a different Telugu association, a different Malayali association, a different Gujarati association, a different Punjabi association, and so on. And in a way that reflects that diversity of India and it's only how it gets in a sense weaponized in narratives which one has to worry about. We saw that in the LTT narratives uh, at the height of the unrest and in, especially in Canada where there was there were large lobbies but also in UK, US and we see a kind of Khalistani mobilization in Canada going on right now as we speak in the especially in the legislature of Ontario, and you it'll be hard for you to write a book on the Hindu Sikh diaspora given this kind of negativity, uh, where a lot of people will want to say, No, 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 we don't want to be this sort of hyphenated uh, uh, Hindu Sikh uh, diaspora identity, uh, especially abroad, especially abroad. So, these are things to talk about. Uh, I didn't want to overly politicize this book. But uh, certainly those dimensions are present. So thank you all once again for joining. And I invite Amit uh, to now uh, give us his remarks. Uh, and then Nandini ji, and then we'll throw it open. 
uh, for a Q and A, and we'll try and stop a little after ten. Thanks a lot. Go ahead, Amitji. Thank you, Professor. Um, you know, I browsed through the book, uh, the ebook, basically, and I was kind of attracted towards the book because of my own work. Um, related to Hindus in Australia, particularly the cross-cultural connections and how did these develop. And I found, you know, as you have pointed out, that the book is very personal. You know, the way he writes is very personal um, interviews. It's like someone is talking to you or just narrating you the whole tale with some history stuff. But I was kind of attracted towards chapter three, particularly because recently, you know, I've been working on my last project was on uh, Indian doctors in Australia, and I wasn't looking at the third wave of diaspora as we talk about, you know, as Pankaj Jain also talks about in his book, the diaspora after 1960s, the doctors, the recognized doctors, but I was looking at the traditional Indian doctors who worked in, Aust in the golden triangle of Australia, Africa, and Britain from 1880s to 1930s, and 1930s is the time when in the West you have these medical laws coming up because at, before that you had freedom of movement. You know, you had the European doctors who were freely moving. Almost anyone can call himself or herself doctor at that point of time. You just needed to be an apprentice or intern with, you know, some, some people. So the way he talks about Indian doctors struggle and hardship in the USA is kind of very relatable to the hardships that Indian doctors face 15 years later in Australia in 1975 onwards when they start moving. And uh, so um, I also kind of noticed that we hardly talk about how diaspora talks to each other. You know, we are always focused mm -hmm. about how Australian diaspora, Canadian diaspora, American diaspora, and the British diaspora, but we never see how these diasporas interact with each other and learn from each other. And that's one of the things that kind of uh, is very interesting in this book because I can, while reading, I can tick a number of things that Australian doctors are presently learning from their US counterparts, Indian doctors in USA. Uh, Indian doctors in Australia last year formed an association. Um, it's called the Australian Indian Doctors Medical Association in Western Australia, and they are working for COVID relief as well. They are sending oxygen cylinders and you know stuff like this. Uh, but the important thing is that they have learned how to lobby for their rights. Um, you know, how, how to, uh, because they have been facing Hindu phobia and they've been very quiet for, term, for some time. And, you know, that migration is um, usually thought to be a very beneficial process. So racism and any other thing that happens should be swept under the carpet. But now the second thing I noticed in his book is the idea of visibility, particularly in chapter three, you know, when he talks about so you mentioned Kamala Harris, how she likes to be visible to the majority as a black Christian. And uh, But if you notice the work of BAPS, this is a very prominent organization and it's in Australia too. BAPS is going to build a 21 million Australian dollar temple, which is going to be the biggest temple in of Hashash practices. You know, if you have been to Australia and you visited the Karamsdown Temple, which is like at the outback of Melbourne, right? Nobody wants to need your own car to visit a temple. Well, the idea of temples or churches or Gurdwara is that they should be easily accessible, right? They should be near your home where you can just worship and then go to your workplace or something like that. But Hindus in Australia particularly um, were being given land outside the townships and it was very hard for these people to you know visit and that's something they have learned from the u.s diaspora they don't need to be shy or hidden anymore right so they're very proud they're learning as pankaj jain also mentions you know so you have so many number of n number of temples although australia in the last count um, hindus were 1.9 percent um, in 2016 census but i think it's going to double or triple this year, and there is a slight play of politics as well. You know, Purushottam Bilamoria wrote his first book on Indians in Australia, and the book was titled Hindus and Sikh Diaspora in Australia, right? And this was in 1980s, <coughs> late 80s, 90s, a very small report kind of book, right? And I, I kind of agree with you that because of the Khalistani, you know, things going around um, and Things have heated up in Australia as well, and US too, and Canada as well. So, um, but in 2016 census, I was also working 
as a radio broadcaster. And I was working as a producer for a Hindi radio channel supported by the government. And we didn't, we just did the normal, you know, advertisements, you know, please participate in the census, you know, write down that you're Indian, you know, heritage and stuff like that. But Punjabi program, you know, our counterparts made sure that they, in every program, every day till census, they mentioned that, please write that you're sick. Please mention in your you know, people usually take others and then leave the box blank. They do not write which other categories they belong to. And that's never counted. But they said, because they're just asking you for Hindus, Christians, Muslims, do write other and mention Sikh. Do write Punjabi. Even if you speak English or Hindi as your first language, but you know Punjabi and you're from Punjab, write Punjabi. So it's a number game at the end of the day. It's a visibility game, right? Um, and, uh, this is one of the things, but talking about chapter three, which is kind of related to my work and Ayurveda, uh, post 1930s in Australia, and I think it's, and for almost 40 years, you have this time frame when medical laws are being written and they kind of exclude the traditional Chinese and Indian medicine out of the framework. And you have, you see, uh, Tajpankar Jain also talks about, he he calls it a reinvention through yoga, yogis, you know, the very famous Canadian Maharishi, uh, Beatles guru, and all those people come into picture in the 1960s and towards 1970s. And you have this reinvention, um, you know, although I would argue that Ayurveda and all these practices were still there, but again, as I said, they were hidden from the plain eyesight, right? Uh, because... A lot of people have written about how Chinese traditional map practitioners carried on their work despite all these legal, you know, mumbo jumbo. They were just carrying, they, they, were, they didn't fear it. The Indians kind of were afraid of the legality, so they left, uh, they went back to India. Uh, then he talks about, you know, particularly in the Western context, the embracing of Ayurveda the embracing of you know, natural traditional medicine. Um, so one is yoga and the other one I think is the organic revolution that has taken place. You know, the hip, the, not just the hippies, but you know, the other um, groups that who are going into organic things. So this embracing is kind of very, very relatable in the Australian context as well. Uh, the, on the Ayurveda thing, I think he could have elaborated more. He could have traced the ancestry of Indian Ayurvedic doctors into USA in during early 1900s, because I am kind of, I'm kind of very confident uh, that America was included in the movement of Indian doctors in Britain, Australia, Africa. And I don't see anyhow they would have left uh, US and Canada out of their, pick, you know, the framework of their work, the sphere of their work. Um, so that's kind of, you know, how I looked at the book. Thank you. Thank you, Amitji. That was very, very uh, well put and, and uh, also very, uh, I think, uh, uh, thought provoking because you raised some very, very important issues. One is how diasporas learn from each other. That's so important. So inter-diaspora uh, studies and relations. This is a very fascinating topic mm -hmm. because normally diaspora studies is homeland host country. Yeah. So there's that uh, dialogic or dialectical, uh, you know, should I say uh, channel yeah. where, uh, you know, the uh, circulation of ideas and, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, energies is seen only homeland host land. Of course, we already mentioned how uh, diasporas are fluid. You start off in Guyana or Fiji and you end up in Canada or the US because the general trend is the coolie diaspora, within quotes, yeah. always ends up trying to get to the advanced, the countries of advanced capital. That's the theoretical framework which we mentioned. But the inter diaspora among the, so to speak, elite diasporas also, like Australians learning from uh, Canadians or Americans or Britons or vice versa, Indian communities, identity politics. You've mentioned very important things that 
visibility, how you're seen in the diaspora. That's what I was trying to talk about. Do you want to be seen as Hindu Jain or just Jain or just Hindu? And uh, what is the politics behind it? So when you're a small group, you want to be identified with a larger group. But if, you, if you're a small group and you find the larger group to be a dead weight, bringing you down, then you want to secede and you want to go off on your own, you know, etc. So there are a lot of very interesting aspects here. You also mentioned chapter three and and what, what I think is called API, that is Association of Physicians yeah. of Indian Origin. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's a very powerful, very important group. I've had uh, a little bit of interactions with them. I also know that, uh, uh, you know, they are a powerful lobby. They're, they're very wealthy. There's more than 100,000 or, you know, 200,000 Indian physicians. And obviously, they'll have two or three uh, professional associations. But yeah. uh, API is certainly very powerful. Uh, they have, uh, you know, lobbyists working on their behalf. And uh, so all of this, uh, you know, has to be factored in when we talk about, uh, and you mentioned BAPS. BAPS stands for Bochasan Vasi Swami Narayan, B-A-P-S, Akshara Purushottam, Bochasan Vasi Akshar Purushottam Swami Narayan. I know this because I wrote a chapter on them in a book I did called Dharma and Development, and I went and visited them. So these are the most, as I said, dynamic of the Swami Narayans, but also very dynamic in terms of, uh, you know, how they've exported Hinduism, with these massive temples, temples at Neastern in UK, all over America. But they're making a state. It's also, uh, uh, you know, the temple also is like a museum or like a, uh, virtual university where people come and learn and they serve good food. Akshar Dham in, in Delhi, in our own backyard, is an example. So there are, there's something big going on here. See, the point is that, uh, just to finish this, uh, Amit, uh, you know, Hindus cannot play their cultural politics, as I see it, as Sikhs or Jains or any Buddhist can. They cannot play a minoritarian politics because, as it were, they are holding a civilization. They're not holding a small identity. So Hindus cannot play the politics of Punjabi or just some, you know, regional. And in a way, BAPS, though it is a very specific kind of Vaishnavite sect, is still opening itself out to say, you know what, Hindus are a big tent. Anybody is welcome to join. And I think this is what uh, other groups also tried. Ramakrishna Mission, I mean, Pankaj went to Ramakrishna Mission when he was studying. Uh, he, st he tells us that in his own introductory chapter. They also try to give you a big tent uh, kind of approach. And it's so ecumenical that, you know, Christ is accepted. All the prophets are accepted. So I think that uh, the inclusive as opposed to exclusive politics of cultural identity is very important. Like in Australia, the insistence on having a kirpan, where there's been a stabbing incident, you know, these are very controversial, sensitive issues. Uh, and the way it's played out and now on the that we are coming to the so called uh, horrible anniversary of Blue Star. And SGBC wants to show the bullet written pictures of that period. So uh, you can see what's going on beneath the scenes. And uh, uh, you know, culture and politics are never easily divorced. With these words, let me invite Nandini ji to make her comments. Please go ahead. And uh, you've reviewed yeah. the book. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, sir. So, uh, since we are hard pressed with time, so I'll just begin with the book. So, uh, United Nations stated in 2020 that uh, India has the largest diaspora population in the world, with around 18 million people of, uh, from the country who are living outside their homeland, with UAE, US, and Saudi Arabia holds the most significant number. And as of today, America is home to 500 million of Hindus and Jets. America has always been represented as the melting point, where different cultures have bestowed their flavor no, to the no. American. No, not 500 million, 5 million. The entire yeah. population of the US is 300 million, so 5 million. Go ahead, yeah, yeah, go five, ahead. sorry. 5 million, did I say 500? Okay, five. I meant 500, uh, 500, sorry, 5 million. Sorry, 
Uh, America has been represented as the melting point where different cultures have bestowed their flavor to the American society. And Professor Jain's book, Dharma in America, Short History of Hindu Jain Diaspora, sheds light on the dharmic practices by the Hindus and the Jains in, American for, in America for decades. His deeply engaging book discusses the ongoing events in education, medicine, cuisine, and music. The book significantly reflects India's contribution to the American society and heritage in different spheres of life. And in his book, he's basically chiefly dealt with uh, Ayurveda, uh, and the Indian doctors, music, food, and education. Professor Jens is also uh, shares with the readers the challenges which have been faced by the Indian migrants in the foreign land. And we have been witnessing the elements of Indian culture merging in the mainstream America. Professor Jen has expeditely dealt with those elements which have been discussed before. So uh, the, how how actually the uh, doctors started? So it was during uh, the Vietnam War in 1967 that there was an influx of Indian doctors uh, the, because of some emergency in the US. And uh, that's how the Indian doctors migrated to United Nations. And also now in this book, we can see uh, that uh, Ayurveda and yoga has uh, how Ayurveda and yoga is actually contributing to the American society. And since uh, Dr. Amit has also talked about Ayurveda, so I'll just move to uh, the other chapter. Indian food, uh, uh, Indian food has slowly but surely found its way into the hearts and stomachs of cities worldwide. Indian cuisine has, for the same reason, been famous and made an impact in the cities of America. The variety of Indian food has been migrating around the world for the last few centuries. And as of 2017, America has been the most significant consumer and importer of spices. Professor Jain also gives the reader a tour of the influence of Indian classical music after the impact of Indian uh, Indic ideas in healthcare. As the doctors of Ayurveda have not been mentioned in the books, Indian classical music also has no mention instead of some passing names of Zuman Mehta and Ravi Shankarji. So uh, one American, uh, George Harrison, the lead guitarist of the Beatles band, is accredited as the first Western musician to uh, integrate Indian music sitar as an alternate of guitar in one of his tracks. Harrison learned uh, sitar from Ravi Shankarji and he continued to experiment with the Indian music. And the, then it lately moved to jazz music. And now we can see that in many areas of America, we see the bhajans and the kirtan being practiced when we can see in the Jain temples and also in the Iskon temples. The book discusses in detail the Jain history also, its arrival, its development and contribution to the American society and its economy. America has been open to different cultures which form different ideologies. American people are also now being open to the third principle of Jaina, which is Anikantvad, which is accepting different views and practices. This principle opens up the intellectual and spiritual boundaries among the people, which can be hopeful in forming a harmonious and peaceful society. Professor Jain has been an educator in America for more than a decade and has been contributing to the education system. And in his book, there's an interview which he gives, uh, which he gives that he's been uh, he's been making efforts to consider Diwali as a holiday, a professional de uh, professional development day for the students in Texas, because in uh, Maryland, in New York, and other uh, in other cities, we can see that Diwali has been uh, Diwali is considered as a holiday in the schools. The, uh, the migration to the United uh, States has always been challenged at higher levels when it comes to uh, the visa system and everything. And the experience of the Indian immigrants offers us valuable lessons. And today there are around 68 uh, Indian Americans who are educated. They have college degrees. Indian also comprises of 8% of the founders of these global giants like Google, Adobe, MasterCard. The second generation Indian Americans, which are below the age of 25, which implies that we are yet to see the influence of those uh, of those Indian Americans in the society. The book has in a widespread way provided us vast information about Indian classical music, Ayurveda, yoga, and also the Jain history and how they've contributed to the American society intellectually, spiritually, and econ economically. Thank you.
Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Nandini ji. You pointed our attention to music, which is very, very crucial. And I think Pankaj ji talks about uh, uh, Sufi Inayat Khan, you know, 1910. These were important moments, both in Britain and in India, where Indian music went out, classical music. In fact, has an acronym, ICM, Indian Classical Music. But the Ali Akbar Academy in, uh, I think, Los Angeles near Hollywood, uh, Ali Akbar Khan was, of course, the great uh, uh, Sarod maestro. So there were two disciples, you know, uh, of, uh, uh, you know, the great uh, Vilayat Khan Sahib. So you had uh, Ravi Shankar on sitar and Ali Akbar on Sarod. So Ali Akbar Khan Sahib actually moved to the U.S. and he has an academy. So a lot of people, his son and others, learned. Allah Rakha, Zakir Hussain is, a, I think, a U.S. permanent resident, if not citizen. So these are precisely these are the aspects which make the book very interesting. That they are opening up, and uh, you know, areas. And now the diaspora has taken it up, uh, you know, uh, you know, upon themselves. Most families teach their children uh, Bharatanatyam, more classical music. Uh, so this has spread uh, incredibly widely in the U.S. And, uh, uh, you know, Carnatic music is also very popular in the U.S. The Wesleyan University has a whole center for Carnatic uh, uh, music, uh, which he, I don't think, mentions. But so this is just touching the tip of the iceberg because you can't cover everything in the book. Now, just a couple of points you made. Uh, one is about the size of the diaspora. I mean, the thing is that the African diaspora, if you call them a diaspora, is a more than a hundred million, you know, the Chinese diaspora. But why are they not considered diasporas as such? Because, I mean, they, they have settled in those countries and they're not identified uh, often, but sometimes they are. Like Indonesia has a very large Chinese population. Thailand has a large Chinese population. Burma has a Chinese so all over East Asia, there are large Chinese populations who have merged with the local communities. So they're not considered diasporic. Similarly, in uh, uh, I think Pankajji has joined us after the program is coming to a close. Pankajji, kya ho ra hai? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, God. It's so confusing. I was in India, so... I I messaged you, I called you, we have been calling. Yeah, They're yeah. saying you ghost. This is called ghosting, you know? You ghost somebody. Chalo, anyhow, you have the last word. We had a very rich interaction which you missed. Now, what, what happened to our friend Jeffrey Longji? I think probably the same confusion. It's just so confusing. I don't know. I don't know. So sorry. So sorry. So it must be pretty late for you, no? Yeah, we 11.36 p.m. Yes, midnight. Yeah, but if you had come at 9, it would have been an hour before. 10.30 would have been a nice time for you to join. Just right, after. Right. Anyhow, so we are, we are actually coming to a close, and I'm going to give it over to you. But I was going to say that, uh, 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 you know, Nandini ji mentioned that India is the largest, India has the largest diaspora. That's not quite yes. true. African diaspora is huge, Chinese is huge, but the numbers, you know, we, you have to, again, it's a politics of numbers. How do you tote up the numbers? Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, how do you harness, as it were, the cultural capital, and of course, the monetary capital that the diaspora holds? And definitely, mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese have done it really well, the way they invested in the mainland via Taiwan. I mean, all this is well known. And the Indians are still trying, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and in fact, there are several Chinese countries. And India, you can't say, I mean, maybe Mauritius and Mauritius Indians are... Uh, to the like best Indian. of my knowledge, Makranji, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the remittance of foreign exchange to their motherland, by that, uh, by that uh, amount, Indians are at number one, to, to the best of my knowledge. That's what I'm saying. No, no, that's, that's what, what I'm, 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 I'm agreeing with one and disputing the second. I'm, okay. I'm saying it all depends on how you define this group. 
because mm. the african diaspora is more than 100 million the irish diaspora is maybe 75 million 50 million but we don't call them diaspora because they've merged with the host country oh, yeah yeah that's yeah. why the remittances are not coming there's nobody to remit to but yeah, okay. but when you look at the struggle the ira and all a lot of money came from the us okay mm-hmm. let's not forget. but the, the point i'm trying to make is that there are several countries now in the world mm-hmm. where indians are the majority mauritius is one guyana yes. suriname yes. uh, you know fiji trinidad so yeah. we are in a new phase of uh, trying to understand who is an indian you know because mm-hmm. everybody says that mm-hmm. indian and if you look at us the the blue tick handle us indian affairs it refers to the native americans so there's a lot of confusion but yeah. i'm going to conclude and yeah. to you the only other thing i wanted to mention nandini ji uh, is about food okay food and ayurveda and now in covid times lot of interest has been directed to immunity rather than uh, only vaccines and social distancing and other prophylactic measures and more and more we are beginning to understand the gut biome and uh, immunity how viruses actually work and in that wasn't lard dr wasn't lard a pioneer whom you interviewed in the book i also met him uh, at a soft power conference in delhi but i mean these people have uh, suggested that you can uh, uh you know uh, through uh, ayurvedic uh, diet and of course in india it's very controversial because the ima has attacked baba ramdev <laughs> so we we'll leave all of that out but it's more and more clear that uh, good health is not a one shot thing literally that you take two jabs in your okay we're learning more and more about inflammation aging uh immunity uh, which is linked to emotional health it's not just um a physical health if you're under tremendous pressure you know what is going on inside your body you don't realize and nutrition it's not just about weight loss or being in great shape many people who are in great shape are not very healthy the immunity is not high because they're so stressed out looking trying to look good you know building muscle or whatever it is they want to do uh, so some people have natural good looks we won't count those in but this whole thing about having your ideal body type weight that creates a lot of stress so we are learning these things and the balancing that ayurveda recommends uh, and so uh, what we call cad cam that is complementary and alternative uh, therapeutic and medical practices are not uh, being ridiculed as some kind of voodoo mumbo jumbo what they call jhad phook or whatever it's called jhad phook it's not now people are taking these things very seriously and meditation yoga so that's another very important thing that uh, pankaj ji has identified so okay pankaj ji you as i said barat nikal chuki hai aur dula aa raha hai but uh, uh, as it, as it were the last last word is yours then we'll have a little bit of q and a and wind it up go ahead pankaj ji okay so uh, i just yeah I, uh, as i <clears throat> Uh, has have already mentioned the book uh, some books idea came to me through the through another book called make uh, muslims and the making of america by professor amir hussain at loyola marymount university and i kept thinking can we think of making of america itself if we replace muslims with hindu then then i thought if we extend the definition of america to include central america or even suriname in south america and fiji and uh, trinidad and guyana and jamaica in central america and caribbean islands maybe we can say that you know indians slash hindus and the making of america in a broader sense in a continental sense and uh, so and then i as i began researching how the indentured laborers were transferred by the british uh, during the british raj in, in all these central american countries and islands and how interesting facts came to me diwali is a national holiday in trinidad for example sarnami is a unique dialect that developed when the bhojpuri or avdi north indian dialects mixed up with surinami local dialects so sarnami is a interesting hindi version which is a totally native to surinam in south america surinam is in south america that itself is an interesting fact i think we think of 
Indians or, or you know, West Indies as in, as in Caribbean islands, but Suriname is actually in South America. So there is a whole country in South America, which has, you know, majority of Indians. Suriname was, uh, was colonized by the Netherlands. So when, when it became, achieved its freedom, many Indians transferred back to Nether, to uh, transfer to Netherlands. So many Indians reached Netherlands by that route. So, so many other facts came to my, in my research, I learned so it, Oh, one of the oldest temples is not in United States, but is in Trinidad, Ghana, Jamaica, those islands, very, very ancient, you know, almost like an ancient Hindu uh, temple in this part of the world, which is, which was, I mean, also interesting to note. Then Raja Ramon Rai's influence on North America is very little known among, uh, uh, even among Indians, you know, of course, we think of Hindus and Indians and we think of Swami Vivekananda, but before Vivekananda was Raja Ramon Rai, greatly influenced North American uh, Christian tradition. That was, I think, interesting to note and to, I guess, remind all of us, especially who are living in the US uh, and, and Indians also in, in India. And then uh, many, many other things, uh, the trade connections between uh, Indians and Americans. Uh, the first person to sign a treaty with Indian uh, American Indians was also in some way or shape also connected with British, rather I forget his name, Corne Cornelius, Cornelius. So how his, uh, he is another connection between America and India. And so many, so many of these little uh, connections. Then Lada, uh, Lala Lajpat Rai's connection in America, how he was received, very well received. And the fight against the British was very well covered in New York, New York Times and some of the, so some of the media was actually very friendly to Indians. Some of the media, not all media that, during that time, during when, when Indians were fighting for, for their freedom. Uh, so that was the first chapter, right? As you know, all of you have already read the book, but some of you, those who have not not yet read the book, I'm just sharing the key points that were sorry, very interesting to me. Then, of course, Ayurveda continues to fight for its validity in America. National Institute of Health (NIH) still has very negative things to say about Ayurveda on its on its website, which is still a problem. And so, Ayurveda, but the good news is that there are more than at least more than 1,000 Ayurveda practitioners who transferred from India in this tech wave. What happened was so many H4 visa holders were all Ayurveda experts, are Ayurveda experts. So they have all started practicing Ayurveda as they got green card. They got a back entry to practice Ayurveda in America through massage parlors, whatever they will call it, studios or whatever, but they are practicing Ayurveda, even though United States government is not really officially promoting them. So that's another interesting facet to making of America by bringing these native, uh, uh, Indian Indic traditions in forms of Ayurveda or even classical music. Another big chapter that Indians have forgotten, Indians who are living in America have forgotten that in 70s, Pandit uh, Ravi Shankar, Alaraka, Zakir Hussain were the mainstream of India uh, of American music, which is largely forgotten. Now today, Indian classical music in America is just a just an afterthought, just maybe a footnote. But in 70s, apparently it was a major musical mainstream. When Beatles were singing the tunes of Pandit Ravi Shankar, and they were composing their music in the in in you know using Hindu ideas and so on, it was a major mainstream musical tradition that was the again sort of in a way making of America through musical tradition, classical music, and then uh, what happened to the Indian doctors or not uh, not Ayurvedic but mainstream allopathic uh, doctors? What happened to them? What kind of fights they had to fight? How they were discriminated against? And so how now today API, AAPI the, is the largest ethnic organization of doctors in America. So how they achieved that success? So, so I dedicate one full chapter by interviewing the founder of the Indian Doctors Association, Dr. Navin Shah. So I, you will find that interview also in, in my book. Interview of like Makhani just mentioned, Makhani just mentioned Dr. Vasant Lars interview, many other Ayurvedic doctor practitioners in Dallas area also I interviewed in the, in the, for the book. And then my own little uh, journey of <laughs> uh, trying to join the democratically join the school board, uh, local school boards. So in, in America, it's really, really interesting. Every school district has its own elections, local elections. It's not like government uh, appoints the head of the school board, but there's an election going on. So how, what issues I faced, that becomes one chapter. So civic bodies, local civic bodies and making of, making of local civic bodies by you know more more and more Indians uh, uh, joining those kind of bodies, uh, so that becomes one chapter, and then and then conclusion and so on. So hopefully, I thought that there are many books on Hindu diaspora in, uh, living in America, but most of those books are all dedicated to temples and sannyasis, 
gurus and so on. So, so I thought Hindus are not just going to temples all the time, not just doing meditation and, and yoga all the time. Hindus are also normal people. They also have their musical tradition, their medical traditions. They also want to contribute to the local uh, school bodies or city councils, which what we call in India municipal bodies. Uh, the, here they are called a city council. So what are the Indian contributions or potential contributions to all these different facets of American life? That's what that's all I wanted to place in this book. So it becomes an alternative book. I think alternative book to uh, other other recent books by Professor Jeffrey Long, also by Phil Goldberg. There are other books that are mostly focusing on spiritual traditions of coming from India. So this is an alternative history kind of in, in a way alternative history of modern alternative history of of American uh, uh, Indians in America, Hindus in America, Jains in America. There is a first ever chapter on the history of Jains in America. We think of 1893 World pa Parliament of World Religions, and we think of we think of Swami Vivekananda. But there was there was also first Jain who came with Vivekananda to Chicago. His name was Virchand Gandhi, and how he brought Jainism to America. And he was also interviewed by New York Times. And then there is now almost 150 years of history of Jainism, Jain ideas, non-violence, uh, traces its idea from uh, from Shrimad from Mahavir Swami to Shrimad Ratchandra to Mahatma Gandhi to Dr. Martin Luther King and the influence on civil rights movement through nonviolent ideas. So I, I also mentioned those things. And then of course, Jain who uh, also came with, with their counterparts, Hindus and others, other people from India and how they set up their own temples, their own organizations. And in North America, there are more than 100 Jain temples. There are more than 1000 uh, Hindu temples in America now, more than 100 Jain temples. And so that's also another interesting history which is often forgotten but or ignored, but this book uh, brings even Jains to the sort of uh, limelight that Jains have also been you know, living and there are more than 100,000 Jain people also in North America. So all of that is what I uh, weave uh, different colors of this spectrum of Indians in America. And so, so the title become Dharma in America here is a book, by the way. I don't know if you already done that uh, ceremony, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for reading my book. Thank you for doing this event. Uh, and uh, you know, it's really kind of all of you to spend time on, on this book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pankaji. I must say thank you for joining us while we discussed <laughs> your book. But uh, I, I think I just wanted to say one or two things. You brought in the continental dimension, which we didn't look at yes. properly. That by America, you mean North and South America. Uh, right. And it's I think it's not just um, Guyana. Uh, these yes. are very interesting cases and uh, some, I mean, I think one of the heads of state took their oath in Sanskrit. Uh, oh, yes. I think, yeah, so a lot of interesting things are going on. And yes. we did mention, you know, the other chapters we, before you came, we talked, we covered some of those, uh, you know, aspects already, uh, including, uh, I was mentioning Avi Kamath's book, I mentioned Ram Mohan. Oh, Bhai. yes. That's very and, important. Uh, this book, uh, you know, I was uh, leading, uh, re, you know, everyone to this book, uh, uh, you know, by Michael J. Altman. He the oh, yes. Hindu yes. and yes. Yes. So these are interesting books. And you missed a very important point that Amit uh, uh, Sarwal, who is from uh. Uh, Fiji, who is now talking, I mean, teaching yes. in the uh, University of South Pacific, made about interdiaspora relations, you know. Oh, how, yes. American models of lobbying and identity politics, uh -huh. census uh, politics are being replicated elsewhere. Uh -huh. And uh, you mentioned language, Surinamese, but yes. Fiji is a classic example. Yeah. Uh -huh. that everyone went to Fiji, they speak Fiji Hindi, which is like <laughs> Bhojpuri. Okay. And there's an epic called Doka Puran in this language. It's an amazing wow. language. So okay. whether you're Tamil descent or uh, uh, you know Punjabi descent, Wherever you're from, when you reach Fiji, everyone speaks one language. So, oh, you know, there are models for nation building that the diaspora threw up. Oh, you know, nice. Whether it's multi, like the Israel model, everyone speaks Hebrew. Of okay. course, we are not, everyone's not speaking Sanskrit. But I'm just making a point that the diaspora yeah. gives you all these models of... Um, uh, uh, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So that I didn't know. So that is very similar to Sarnami language of So the way That's a local so, language does. Exactly, which is like Hindi, which is intelligible. Yes. But, uh, yeah. Yes. 
So, it's a mix okay, of English, Bhojpuri, and Bhojpuri. Yeah, you need to say something. Go ahead. But I just yeah, want yeah, to say yeah. we, must, we must end by 10.30 because I have things. But I'll go ahead. And I think, I think, uh, I think Professor Anil Tiwari will say a few words. So, but yeah, Amit, go ahead yeah, from so, Jammu. He's a philosophy yeah. professor from Jammu. Go ahead. Yeah, I just have a question, not a question, but you know, I made the remark about visibility of the diaspora. Now, Hindu diaspora is kind of saying that we, we won't be hidden no more, right? So we are going to come to the front. We are going to showcase proudly that we are Hindus. And there is a backlash on this, particularly, I think uh, someone has just written in the chat, particularly through the symbol of swastika. I remember in 2016, I covered a news where uh, a Hindu family during Diwali has made the Rangoli with swastika outside their home and the Australia Post postie came, the postman came and he is caught on CCTV destroying the whole Rangoli. And then when the inquiry took place, he said it was a hate symbol. Right. So and then the whole family and we covered the news and we had to educate people that this is not this is a swastika. It's not the, you know, the hmm. sign. So, yes, yes. but there is this proud kind of feeling that the, this is who we are, kind of taking control hmm. of their own narrative as hmm. Hindu characters are basically in these countries taking. Do you see it that way in America as well? Yes. Yes. This is. Uh... Uh, you know, one of the burning issues that Hindus are facing in America, and there are now very active organizations such as Hindu American Foundation, which are always eager to take these issues. And they are doing a pretty good job, I would say. I think on many issues such as yoga, yoga, they have done a fantastic job uh, taking yoga back, uh, for example. And recently they filed a lawsuit uh, for similar, on, on similar issues. Uh, there were you know, all kinds of issues. So, yeah, so that's a very, very, uh, you know, that that's a uh, I think a good model of 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 taking up these issues and and really fighting back, uh, and and so it's it's a long fight it's a long way to go you know and because we are such a small minority here and not everybody is registered to vote both parties take us for granted Republicans and Democrats but uh, HA, people in HAF have done I think great job in, in in forming bridges with both the parties both the parties cannot ignore us in in, in certain ways. But, but but the issues exactly. are ongoing. Exactly. I think you put it very well. This is a very long fight. And uh, yes. uh, we have to learn from the, uh, you know, the Jewish community. Yes. Uh, how they held out for 300, 400, 500 years when they had absolutely no rights. And then gradually came out and infiltrating into the media. Yes. Where representations yes. of Hindus are really bad. You know, all over, if you look at uh, not just Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Oh, yeah. But generally, and even in Bollywood. So, Amit, it's a really complex issue, but uh, yeah. you're absolutely yeah. right. The, they are, you know, coming out of the closet, fighting for your culture, the California textbook case, yes. uh, a case against yes. McDonald's. Uh, where yes. If you've got beef, you have to tell us. Then if expensive. you don't eat it. So all of that. So labeling, but I think we're almost out of time. So I want to invite uh, Amit ji and then finally Smita ji, and then we're going to close. Amit ji, breathe, please. Go ahead. I'll give, my time. I'll give my time to anyone else who wants to speak because I've kind of taken a lot of your time. Thank you. Oh, okay. Anybody else? I can't hear you, Professor Karanj. Should I go ahead? You are not. You are not audible, sir. I, I'm, I was going to say, Nandini ji, do you have any concluding remarks before I invite uh, Smita ji and uh, and Professor Tiwari to say a few words, and we're going to close. Yeah, Nandini ji. Um. Yes, sir. Uh, no. Uh, Professor Jain has uh, already talked about uh, many issues now, which uh, I've not been able to take in. So that's okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Uh, uh, and now, now I, I invite uh, uh, Dr. Anil Tiwari to say a few words and then give it over to finally to, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Shreem Go ahead. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Thank you for uh, considering me 
uh, to speak few words on this occasion. Uh, I just uh, could browse through uh, the book uh, by Pankaji. Uh, I have stolen it from one website. In fact, it is called Gen Lib. <laughs> <laughs> it is available in soft copy. I don't know if you are aware. <laughs> I didn't know. So. <laughs> so, Let's not talk about all this. Let's yeah. not talk about <laughs> <Sorry>. all this. <laughs> Copyright and so forth. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, you'll find many of my books there also. The more the merrier if people read. So anyhow, yeah. carry on. Uh, so, sir, uh, what I wish to uh, propose, in fact, uh, when we talk of uh, uh, diaspora, of course, uh, it has its root in, in the Indian culture. And uh, one of the hallmarks uh, of Indian culture is that it is the tradition of seekers. Whether uh, we are so-called Hindu, in fact, I don't prefer the term Hindu. I always prefer Sanatan, Dharma. So, uh, to highlight this very essential feature of Indian culture, that it is a tradition of seekers, whenever we propose, of course, one way or the other, this need to be highlighted, I think, uh, in every work, whether it is carried out uh, because of any regions, a number of uh, people or identity or whatever regions, but this uh, should not be missed, I think, in any work. And I wish to refer to a beautiful article by Jonathan Ganeri. Uh, it is titled Epistemic Pluralism from Systems to Stands. And in this article, it was published in Journal of the American Philosophical Association in 2019. And he beautifully points out the uh, Jaina epistemology by suggesting that it is basically stance pluralism as opposed to system pluralism. And this is something which represents what I say, the seekers uh, mentality or seekers disposition and Jaina tradition beautifully represents it uh, in terms of Anekantavada. So I thank uh, Pankaji uh, for uh, having a very nice contribution uh, and pointing out uh, relevant parts. And uh, certainly he has mentioned Ayurveda and other uh, other things. And then uh, Professor Paranjapre mentioned Bochasan Vasi. I happen to be uh, from a district called Gonda in Uttar Pradesh. And uh, the Swamiji who's, who established inside Swami Narayan Sampradha, he belongs to my district. So I feel proud <laughs> in, in uh, uh, claiming this. And uh, it's a beautiful work, in fact, going on. And these things need to be highlighted uh, at every platform. So thank you very much. I congratulate Pankaji for uh, contributing to this scholarship. Thank you very much, sir. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And we salute you for coming from that place where the great person was My born. Honor. Thank Near you, Ayodhya, sir. isn't it? Near Ayodhya. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is in Gonda district. Okay. It's my home district. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Srinivas. It is called Swami Narayan Chapia. In fact, Chapia is a place in Gonda district. So yes. it belongs to that place. And Swami Narayan Temple has, uh, uh, in fact, adopted that village and oh. have made the beautiful developmental works there. Oh, so I very see. Nice. Yes. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Thank you. Go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say congratulations, Pankaj, but also, um, you know, uh, growing up, of course, we had many moving uh, visits to Shravana Bedgora and uh, visiting the Maha Mastakabhisheka and so on. So one of the interesting features, it seems to me, particularly as academics, is a way to convey some of the core bridging concepts, some of which are distinct across um, the uh, Hindu and Jaina philosophies, but many which are shared. And it seems to me that in the sort of realm of more popular books, uh, you know, I was thinking of Stephen Cope's work on Karma Yoga, uh, the great work of your life, for example, which takes on 
some of the core issues um, of um, yoga philosophy, but converts it into the way from uh, action of everyone from Whitman to um, uh, discussions of the Underground Railroad and so on. And there's a way in which to kind of bridge, even if people themselves were not necessarily inspired by um, a concept, uh, he does a very sort of elegant um, um, job of showing how it permeates people's philosophies, irrespective of where, whether they themselves subscribe. And it seems to me that there is some power to that kind of narration. Uh, and I was quite struck by the swastika sort of strategy, not only to seek out allies amongst um, uh, people who have been the most hurt by it, who are of course Jews, but to also find a bridging language with um, Native Americans or others who may see ancient symbols as a core part of their culture or a core philosophy. So it does seem to me there's an opportunity for those of us who teach uh, to think a little bit more strategically, not just about the chair and endowment battle, which I think has been quite pronounced, uh, but perhaps to take some of the insights of your book, which I look forward to reading, and think of a way of translating it into a wider uh, a, a wider association beyond what we appreciate in ours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Srinivas. Very well taken. Your points are really valuable. I was just uh, going to, uh, something struck my mind, which is that the birth name of uh, Lord Swami Narayan is Ghansham Pandey. So that sounds very <laughs> close to Tiwari also. You know, Saryu Paran <laughs> all of that. So just, anyhow, so yes, we've sir. had a wonderful uh, discussion. I now invite uh, Ritika ji to give a br brief vote of thanks uh, and uh, uh, also tell the, uh, you know, uh, all the people who are participating about our next activities, give us a little bit of a heads up of what we are planning to do later in June and also in July and our big Aurobindo conference uh, on the 1st of uh, uh, August, hopefully. So, and uh, my, uh, my uh, uh, advice to uh, Pankaji, please be on time next time. Anyhow, thanks a lot. Thank I'm you sorry. for joining. <laughs> And uh, uh, go ahead, uh, Ritika. That's, that's carrying, in fact, Indian nest <laughs> being little late. No, 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 no. I'm never late on any event in my entire life. This happened because of the confusion of the time lag. I thought I'm behind. Uh, I thought I'm ahead of India because of the confusion. Because I was in eight months, I was in India. Before that, 25 years, I was in US. Now I'm back in US. I'm still confused. By this time gap. Otherwise, I'm never late, sir. Never, never, never. No worries, no worries. I was just pulling your leg. Being a friend and a speaker. Okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, go, go ahead, uh, uh, Ritika ji. Please unmute yourself. Still muted, but uh, anyhow, no worries. I'll just then conclude. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Pankaj ji. Uh, thank you so much, Amit ji. Thank you, Nandini ji. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, uh, Smita ji. Thank you, Anil ji, and all our fellows and other participants today. And uh, hope to see you soon. Check our website for our uh, uh, you know upcoming events. There's two I want to especially highlight. I already mentioned the conference on Sri Aurobindo and uh, India's Renaissance, because we are celebrating 150th, the 150th, the sesquicentennial anniversary of uh, Sri Aurobindo, along with India at 75. So please join us then, uh, first to third. And in addition, uh, we hope to have uh, uh, two important events in between. One is on Vaitarik Swarajya, that is, uh, Swarajya or uh, decolonization of ideas, which continues our theme we had uh, beyond the imperialism of categories. So that is coming up in June 19th, I think, 18th, 19th. Uh, and then uh, later, we are also 
we invite you to a meeting where we uh, want to uh, really, first of all, talk about what has happened in the past uh, one or two years at IIAS uh, and get your views on what should happen in the future. So the idea is uh, to, uh, uh, you know, basically disseminate uh, through social media and through virtual uh, mode uh, the, the work that we've been doing, the books that have been published, the conferences held, the distinguished lectures, the areas we focused on despite the pandemic, and get your insights, get your views, get your criticism, uh, positive criticism uh, about what we can do in the future. Thank you. With those words, uh, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful day. And Pankaji, sleep well and see you soon. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Oh, we also have a, a workshop on historiography. So we'll yes, I want to remind you. Yes. That's very July exciting. 15th. July 15th. Very important. Uh, a uh, workshop on historiography, how Indian history has been written with very distinguished participants, including uh, Professor Wies uh, and, uh, you know, Lavanya Ji is going to uh, conduct this and uh, some other very important participants, uh, you know, both from the U.S. and India. Okay, bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.